chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. We're looking at verses 1 through 17 this morning. And I imagine I would like to go further, if God permits. We'll see. The title of the message this morning is The Purpose of Providence in the Salvation of God's People, or the Salvation of Israel. The Purpose of Providence in the salvation of Israel. And this is the purpose of the message, that you who are believers might take comfort in knowing that God is sovereign in all providence, in all circumstances, in all events of time and eternity, and is doing everything, everything for the salvation of of His people. That's a purpose. If you get nothing, you should get that. And this text by the Holy Spirit is proof, is proof of God's work in providence to save His people by Jesus Christ alone. Now, Let's look at these first couple of verses here. In verse 1 of chapter 45, it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break into pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasure of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Now the Lord in this chapter calls out and declares His sovereign will concerning Jerusalem, concerning the destruction that is to come of Jerusalem and its deliverance, and its deliverance. That Cyrus, this man Cyrus, was anointed, an anointed man by which Israel should return to Jerusalem. And this was fulfilled some 200 years after this prophecy was made. This prophecy was 200 years before the birth of this man, Cyrus. And some years after that, it was God who opened the treasures of darkness and hidden treasures and conquered the Babylonian kingdom by this man Cyrus. God reveals how he would do that. Look at that. He said he would open the two-leaved gates and take up all the treasures. Now the walls of Babylon were so high, none could scale them. They were so thick, none could penetrate them. Do you know how? Cyrus got into Babylon through two leaved gates under the city that were not shut. You remember Belshazzar had that drunken party that night and God had written on the hand by his hand on the wall that he was found wanting in the balances and the kingdom was to be taken that very night and that very night the two leaved gates were open and none could shut them and Cyrus and his army went in and conquered them just as God said 200 years before it took place. But what was the purpose? What was the purpose? Why should Cyrus be victorious? Why should this man be raised up who knew not God? And we'll get to that. He knew not God. 
And yet he did exactly as God determined before to be done. How is that? What for? Why does God do what God does? Look at verse 4. Here it is. Gives us the reason. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, mine elect. I have called even thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. He did this for the salvation of Israel. Behold how God uses a man who does not even know him, uses a man that does not worship him, and yet raises him up to power, sets him upon the throne, expresses his purpose that he should save his people. And that's exactly what happened. He did something no other king had ever done. He freed them to go back to their land and establish their own worship. Why? God said to. God purposed it, and it took place. Did he not do this before? Have you not seen this? Isn't this a rerun of what God does all the time? He did this with Pharaoh, did he not? He said, have I raised thee up for this purpose, that I might show my name and power to Israel, to my people, to save my people. Even so he did with Cyrus, that the name of the Lord should be declared throughout the whole earth. Verse 5, he says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. God did this for Israel, that they might know, that his people might know the truth and find comfort in it, that he alone is God. Now you, you who are spiritual Israel, this was written for your comfort. This was written for you who are the people of God, the servant of God. You were formed of God. You were formed of God, created of God in the new man, the new birth. And seeing God will not ever forget you. He will not ever forsake you. Seeing He has blotted out your transgressions by the blood of His only Son. And seeing He has, we are redeemed by His one offering and robed in His righteousness. Let this be example, this example of God's power in the affairs of men and providence comfort you. Comfort you. To know this, that all God does, He does for you. He does it to save you. And so whatever is being done for His people, it will be used of God to save them, to bring them and keep them in Christ. Seeing for God loved us with an eternal love, chose us. He redeemed us. He called us. He keeps us. He alone is God, and there is none beside Him. What does that mean? There is none to oppose Him. Isn't that right? If there's none beside Him, there's none to oppose Him. There's none to stop Him from doing what He determined. Was there any chance Cyrus would not do this? Any. Any at all. Was there any way for this man not to be born, not to rise to power, not to have those leave gates open, not to save Israel? Absolutely not. Even so it is, especially with spiritual Israel. There was no way that you were not going to be saved. It was already determined. It was already purposed. Listen to the word of God in verse 7. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And we know that God is not the author of sin and that's not what it intended. But I do know this, that God uses it. 
He uses evil men and circumstances for the salvation of his people. Remember Joseph? What did he say? He said, you meant it for evil. Now, is there any way that he would not be sold? Nope. And yet he was sold for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, God is not the author of sin. Satan is. But no sin entered into God's world except God had decreed it and purposed it for his own sovereign will in order to display his goodness, there must have been sin. You got that? Sin, it, it, God wanted to display his righteousness. He'd allow sin into the world and just leave it, not save you. Someone, I put it in the bulletin, if hell were full of men and there were no salvation, that would be a display of God's righteousness, wouldn't it? But see, God not only wanted to display his righteousness, he wanted to display his goodness. And this is what it is to be saved from sin. What he meant for evil, God intended for good. And there's, this is a better salvation in Christ than ever could have been accomplished in salvation that Adam would provide. So everything is according to God's sovereign will. In Isaiah 46 and verse 9, he said, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end at the beginning. And from ancient times, the things are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Behold, Satan was created of God as all things to accomplish his sovereign will, that he should manifest his grace and power in saving his elect from their sins. So then, we should know all things are under the hand of God. He said, I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Both the good of men and the evil of men in the earth are either allowed or restrained so as to fulfill God's sovereign purpose. Scripture says, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. What about the rest? The remainder of wrath. That wrath that does not praise him, what does he do? He restrains it. He doesn't allow it. See then his purpose in using evil and the wrath of man and Satan and all the evil host is for the glory of his name and the salvation of his people. I'll give you another illustration. Judas Iscariot. Is that not an illustration of it? He was the son of perdition, the son of ruin, the son of great loss and damnation. But you know that he was foretold of. Jesus said that. He said, I have kept them that thou gavest me, except but the son of perdition, that it might be fulfilled of the scripture. It was ordained in Psalm 109. It declares how Judas would come and betray the Son of God. This man was chosen among the twelve, but not one for salvation. He was chosen to be the betrayer. What was God's purpose in such darkness? In ordaining this man, was it not our salvation? Had Christ not been betrayed, we should not, he should not have been crucified. You see what God has done? God used what that man longed to do. Now, he did exactly what he longed to do. But in doing so, he did exactly what God determined to do. This man, hatred for Christ and love for his sin and self-righteousness, he betrayed him. But in doing so, he fulfilled the will of God. Even so it was with Pilate, the Jews, and everyone else. That's what Paul, uh, Peter says in Acts chapter 2. He says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves know. Listen. 
him being delivered by Judas? No. By the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. You see both the responsibility and sovereignty there? God determined it, yet it was their hands that did it. Judas gets no pass because he was ordained to this. He did exactly what he wanted to do. Yet in doing so, he did the will of God for this cause, to save his people from their sins. He's doing everything for that. Look at this in verse 8. He said, I do all of this. I form the light, create darkness. I made peace, create evil. I, the Lord, do these things for what? And this is what he commands. He says this, Drop down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Herein is the gospel commanded and ordained of God. Drop down that word righteous. In one translation it says righteous one. Drop down you righteous one from heaven. Who is that? I do all things that this one righteous one should come down from heaven. Isn't that what he's doing with the salvation of national Israel? He is, he is preserving the line of Christ. He said, I do all of this that the righteous one should come down from heaven. This is God's purpose in all providence that Christ should come down. That he being God, the God of heaven, the Son of God, one with the Father and Spirit, the deity, all in deity and attributes, especially righteousness, that he should come down to do what? To bring forth salvation. To bring forth salvation. And he, he says, drop down you heavens, kind of like rain. He said, pour down like rain on the desert. Hosea says the same thing when he says this in Hosea 6, 3. He said, and you shall know if you follow after to know the Lord. His goings forth is, listen, prepared as a morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. And he who is righteous shall come as rain upon the desert. Jesus Christ. How shall he come? Listen, the earth is to open up. What is this but the womb, the the he said he comes from the, the depths of the earth, which is the womb of the virgin. He should come forth. He should be brought forth as a man made under the law. For what purpose? To redeem his people from the curse of the law. He came to provide righteousness, to establish the law. You remember what he said in Matthew Matthew chapter 5, he says this about, his, uh, about him and the law. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. To fulfill the law. Fulfill righteousness. That's what he came to do. He came to make satisfaction of God's justice by the offering of himself to God. So look now, believer, and see the goodness and grace of God toward us and that His sovereign will and providence was for Christ to save us in setting up a kingdom and casting down another in setting up wicked men and using their evil devices. For what? So that Christ should come and die for our sins. I praise God He used Cyrus. I do. Because by Cyrus, Israel was delivered, the line was kept, and Christ came, even as he prophesied he would. He came down, dropped down in righteousness to bring forth salvation to spring up together. 
Rejoice, therefore, you elect, for God hath from the beginning chosen you to this. And moved all men and kingdoms to preserve the seed of Abraham, by which Jesus Christ, the righteous, should come into the world. And it was by a sovereign decree of God, by him you should be made holy. Isn't that what he said? According as he had chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be be holy and without blame before him. In love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. How should he do all this? By Jesus Christ to himself. To himself. Therefore, he says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will by the which will. We are made holy, sanctified by the blood of Christ once for all. And listen what he said in verse 8 of our text. I, the Lord, have created it. In other words, I have chosen it. I have made it. I have purposed it, and you listen, I have accomplished it. Isn't that something? It's pretty confident language, isn't it? Will we dare to say anything like that? He said, look, I've already done this. This is in, in the purpose and mind of God, this was already done. This was, this was as good as done. It was already done. Now look and see the truth of the salvation of the Lord. See how he uses Cyrus, Pharaoh, Judas, Pilate, the Jews, wicked men, and especially all providences to fulfill his purpose, which is to save his people, spiritual Israel, from their sins. And so by our text, as well as by the Scripture, declares the whole purpose of God in the providence of time is to do what he purposed in eternity. To save you. Now then, you who believe this is not offensive, this is good. Now to some, this is offensive. To some who believe themselves to be capable of providing some righteousness for themselves, to be capable of obtaining the grace of God by the mere act of the human will. This is offensive to him. It is offensive. It is offensive to believe in the sovereign free, free grace of God because they believe in the sovereign free will of man. That God wants men to be saved, that Jesus died for all the sins of all men, and if man will make a determination that man alone has the ability to determine his own destination. Now them, to them, this gospel is offensive. If you believe that man's will either determines God's will or that man's will somehow changes God's will, or moves God to, by merit, this gospel will always be offensive to you. But what saith the word of God? Here it is. For the children, not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil. Listen, that the purpose of God according to election, might stand. It is said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he told you by Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth or him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. 
And then he uses that illustration of Pharaoh. Have I not raised up Pharaoh for this one purpose, that I might show my name and my power? Has he not raised up Cyrus for this one purpose, to show his name and his power in the saving of Israel, his people? And so then you'll say to me, why did he yet find fault? Well, if God chose a people and Christ died for them only, and the only the elect are going to be called, how can you find fault with a, with a man, seeing he has no choice? Paul uses this very text. Who are you to reply against God? Shall the thing form say and did, what hast you made? Hath not the potter power of the clay? Look what it says. Anybody who hates this message of Christ coming down, of God using all providence to bring in Christ and save his people, what does it say? Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say unto him that fashioneth, What makest thou, or what thy work? Who hath no hands? Woe unto him that saith to his father, What begettest thou? Or the mother, What hast thou brought forth? Isn't that the same thing? And what Paul said, who are you to reply against God? This is the purpose of God. To use all men in providence, even evil men, to bring forth this purpose. To save his people from their sins. Save his people from their sins. You who are made of God. God has told you of his salvation how he will use all men in providence to bring it to pass. How Christ must come from heaven to fulfill all righteousness. How he should be born of a woman, made flesh under the law to fulfill the law. Why then will you rebel? Why, why rebel against it? Is it not futile? Is it not pointless to rebel and resist against God? It is. But that only shows the depravity of man to do it. And so then, if you will not resist, do you understand your condition? Do you understand? Do you long to know if Christ came to die for you? That's a good question, isn't it? If God's only died for the elect, if he's only purpose to save the... Isn't it a question that should come to the mind of a, one made sensible by the Spirit of God? Am I one of these? Do I have part in this? Do I know? How can I know? Look at what verse 11 says. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker... Ask of me the things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hand, command ye me. Do you long to know if this righteousness rained down is for you? Ask. Is it that what he's saying? Ask of me concerning my sons. Concerning those sons that I have chosen, concerning the work that I will do, ask of me. And I'll tell you. Christ says, ask. Behold, the Lord Jesus Christ gives these things concerning his sons. Look, do you want to know if you are? Look at this. He says, I've made the earth and created man upon it. I have even, I even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all the host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. This is speaking of Christ that has dropped down. I have called him in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. For what purpose? He shall build my city, my church, my people. He will save my elect. How will he do it? He shall let go my captives. What is the sons of God? How do you know if you're a son of God? Have you ever been captive? 
The sons of God by nature are captives. Captives to sin. Captives to the old nature. When God put Adam in the garden, created him, he lost everything by his sin. He lost all ability. He became a captive. And so did all of his race become captives, sold under sin. And by no means could we free ourselves. But what then is the work of God concerning his sons? He says, I will let my captives go. Notice they were captives of his. They were captives of his justice, captives of his judgment. And he says, my deliverer, my redeemer shall come and he shall let my captives go. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. You shall be free indeed. Now listen, this ransom price, this ransom price was paid long before you ever experienced freedom. It was paid 2,000 years ago. But what was happening? In the providence of God, he was working all things to bring you under the sound of the gospel by which the Holy Spirit gave you life. Opened your eyes to see your need and captivity and you cried out unto God. If you are the sons of God, because you are the sons of God. God has set forth His Spirit into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You see, because you were sons, God sent forth His Spirit unto you. And the manifestation that we are sons of God is this. We were captives, but now we're free. Free from what? Free from the law. Free from the law. Free from the law. Oh, happy condition. Jesus is bled and there is remission. Free from sin. That's why you're free from the law. You're free from the penalty of sin. The guilt of sin. Isn't that something? God has justified you. Therefore, you are justified. Free from the guilt of sin. Having all the guilt of our sin imputed to His Son and charged to Him, God poured out His wrath on Christ our Savior. And sin is paid for. And so the price was paid long before you experienced it, but grace came in the providence of God, worked all things together, and He has now set you free. And you are free from the power of sin. Sin no longer reigns in you. Sin abides in you, but it does not reign in you. Why? Because sin is the cause of every evil in this world. Sin is the cause of death, and especially the death of my Savior. And we loathe the very sight of it. It does not have the power it once had. And one day you shall be free from the very presence of sin. This is our hope, isn't it? This is our confidence that God is still moving in providence to keep us in Christ. To keep us in Christ. So then, are you a son? Has this work been accomplished in you? The next thing is this, you'll be a witness of his. Look at this in verse 14. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and the merchandise of Ethiopia and of Sebians, men of stature, shall come over to thee, and they, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee, and shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. What does God do but reveal His Son in us? And all the world comes around in their chains and they cannot but help but say, God is in thee. Surely God is in thee. To make such a change in such a sinner, God would have to be in you. And so then we are His witnesses. We are His witnesses. Verily thou art God, that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that make 
the, that are makers of idols. In other words, when, when, when men of the world see Christ in us, you know what they do? They mimic it. They desire to mimic what you have. You have righteousness. What do they do? They desire to mimic your righteousness. You have hope in His blood. They desire to mimic His offering. They make idols. They say God is too, too hard to be known. He cannot be known. They can't be known to them. And what does God say? They shall go and be confounded. What about you, son? What about you, son of God? You who have the work of the Spirit wrought in you. Verse 17. But Israel shall be saved. And where is their salvation? In the Lord. And what's the duration of it? With an everlasting salvation, you shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Believer, what is God doing right now? What is God doing? You can bet this. He is working all of these things, evil and good. Working everything to save Israel. So you can see it in anything. You can see it in everything. So you're not confounded. You're not confused. I know you get confused. It's because you take your eye off the purpose of God. You're missing the purpose. God is doing all things to bring you to Himself. And whatever He's doing, it's best. Would you dare do it another way? I know the flesh would. But he must be killed. He must be killed. Let God be true. And every man, including this one, be a liar if he's against God. Isn't that comforting? So he says this, Look unto me, all you ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Why? For I'm God and there is not another one. There is no salvation anywhere else. God saves. I pray that God would open your hearts today and cause you to believe on His Son. To surrender everything. Why? Because he's working all things for your salvation. And God bless this to you. Stand, be dismissed in prayer.